Hello, everyone. Good evening and welcome to our live, which is titled, excuse me, which is titled Step Parenting and Blending Families. And that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about what you can do if you're in a position where you're contemplating becoming a step parent, if you're, if you're um, thinking of getting into a second marriage or you are already and you trying to blend families, I certainly will do my best to share my own experiences and the best practices of uh, my parents and share with you some of the research and some advice that, that some of the top experts in the field uh, find to be most helpful. So to begin with, this is um, my father, Abba's Yartzeit, my non-biological father, his Yartzeit uh, was today, Shlame Zevon Baruch Yehuda. And my mother, Allah Shalom, is a Bela Bas from Moshe David. Um, it's in memory of, their, of them and everything they did to just be extraordinary role models and blend our families together. So I'm going to begin just with, with an overall thought I, that we're going to be balancing this between words of encouragement, which I think are important and I, I absolutely feel are appropriate in a situation like this, and some practical advice to be just pragmatic and to give you the best advice I can, um, including some of the things that proper planning and mindfulness can help you avoid some of the challenges. So I do want to approach this with an optimistic eye, but an extremely realistic one also, and help you make the decisions that will result in the best way possible. Just by way of background, um, my father died uh, shortly before my fourth birthday. Uh, there were three of us, my sister and a brother, the full biological brother and sister. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, my mother remarried a, a wonderful man, Rav Shlomo Nutovic. He had a son from a previous marriage and Baruch Hashem, they were blessed with the child together. So th this was, a, this was you know, well over 50 years ago when you know, blending families, well, I don't even know if it was a term. And it certainly wasn't common to have uh, this sort of arrangement. And, you know, my parents, in other words, didn't really have those best practices to, to guide them, but they had their internal um, commitment and some of the things that I'm going to talk about. So the encouragement part is that I do believe it's possible to really make this work. And there's, there's so much that you can do you know, you're, I, I said earlier in a, in a short video that I did as a promotion here that a, a second marriage just by definition is plan B, which means it's something that the families didn't count on having. And to some degree, it requires a great deal of thought because we're dealing with a, a, a challenging situation as it is. But done properly and done wisely, um, you're, I, I give you a bracha from the bottom of my heart that if you embark on this blending families and becoming a step parent, I give you a bracha from the bottom of my heart that your children should feel about you one day the way um, the three of us feel about Abba and, and Isaac, our our my, we didn't use the word step in my home, I was stepbrother, felt all the years about my mother. And, and like I said, I think it's something, I think it's something very doable. You do not need to be perfect parents. And let's just state that right away. We're all human. We all um, come to this world with our strengths and weaknesses. We all make mistakes. We all wish, in, in a first marriage, we all wish we had a do-over with many things but you don't need to be a perfect parent. That's not what this is about. In fact, um, during Shiva, my non-biological father, Abba, passed away first. So the five of us sat Shiva together with our, together with our mother. And oh, my mother would joke around that I'm standing Shiva because I'm a restless person. 
So I, whenever I had an excuse to get up, uh, I tried to, to exercise that. Anyway, there was a woman standing by the, by the door, um, by the door of our home. The five of us were all next to each other and our mother was at the end. And this woman was just watching the family not coming forward to any of us. So uh, one could say that I had an excuse to get up, but I, I also just went over to other people, just, you know, sometimes it might be a business uh, relationship where they don't know the family. So I just wanted to make them comfortable. I, I said, are you, who are you here for? You know, can I introduce you? So she said, no, actually, I saw that you're sitting Shiva. And I saw, to, to me, she saw one of my posts about sitting Shiva. And she said, I, I just remarried. And I told my second husband that I'm only willing to go into a marriage, a second marriage, if we're going to have a real family. I want to have a real family with him, which parenthetically, um, my mother once asked Abba um, why he was willing to marry a woman with three young children. She, she, my mother had three children under the age of six when she married Abba. Um, so he said that it's true, it would have been more convenient to marry someone with older children, but he wanted to have a real family with my mother and he wanted it to be a real family. And he said, he said he didn't feel it was that likely to happen with adolescents. Anyway, so this woman expressed a similar uh, feeling and she said, it's hard. This is what she said, it's difficult. We're trying to make it all work. So she said, I wanted to come by here. I've just been watching the five of you to draw strength and encouragement that this is what it could look like one day. So that's what it could look like. And anyway, we wrote that article together. I wrote I promised her that I would write up how my parents, she asked me, how did your parents do it? So we, I wrote an article called Blending Families and we, but we did it all collaboratively. All of the children and my mother, Alash Shalom, contributed some thoughts to it. I mentioned this because one of the lines in the piece said that, you know, that Abba and Mami weren't perfect parents. And we as children certainly had many, many things that we would have loved to have a do-over on, you know, many things that we did wrong and mistakes that we made, but we all made it work. That's what I wrote. So one of my siblings came and said, you know, Yankee, it's not bakovedic, it's not proper, it's not right to, to put a negative tone like that, that mommy and Abba weren't perfect parents. So I said, you know, I told him the story about this woman who came to see our family. And I said, excuse me, I said that if they would think, if that woman would think that we were all perfect children and our parents were perfect, then there wouldn't be a takeaway lesson for her because she's like everybody else, not perfect. So I said, I think it's, I think the greatest compliment that we can give our parents is to write an honest, truthful experience that they were fantastic people who weren't perfect like everybody else, but they were, they were deeply committed um, to making it work. And the three things that, that I, I would like to speak about and I think are, are really important, um, are governing principles, meaning setting a set of goals, not for the details of day-to-day, -day, but overall what we're trying to accomplish with the family and, and what's the, you know, how things, I'll explain what I think their governing principle was. An overall sense of mindfulness, meaning that, um, that the decisions that any parents make but certainly um, step parents, you know, parents who are blending families, there should be, or certainly it's helpful to have um, a, a significant amount of mindfulness into decisions that are made. I'm gonna give two examples um, that, that I was privileged to see by our parents and planning, which is probably the most important thing that you could do um, is to really plan for this. Um, you know, some of the reality, um, my, I have my my dear friend Rabbi Shlomo Goldberg is a is a, a principal of of Yeshiva RLO in, in Los Angeles. We're, we're great friends, and 
he started, you know, he started as a principal years before me and he, he was mentoring me. I call, I would call him from time to time to ask questions. So at the beginning, it was only, you know, my wife and I basically ran everything ourselves. And then we wound up hiring department heads. So I, I told Shlomo, I can't wait next year. They're going to be department heads in the school. That's going to be so much easier. And he said something that was so wise. I did not appreciate it at the time. So he said, I've hired many people in my life in, in school. Um, some made my life, most of them made my life easier. Some of them made my life more difficult, but not one of them made my life less complicated. And what he was saying is that when you have a small staff, let's say in, in the case, my wife and I, there's only the two of us. Once you start bringing people in, things get more complicated. And that's, you know, a good place to start thinking about a second marriage, about a, a blending family, that there are so many moving parts and so many constituencies that, that you have the families, the extended families on both sides, the children themselves, both your exes, if they're alive, if it's a divorce or, or, or um, you know, one of them, God forbid, if, there's, if, if, uh, if, if it was as a result of, of uh, death, but, and you also have to hit the ground running. It's not like a, a, a regular um, a regular wedding when you have your first, one has a first marriage, <clears throat> you have time to grow into the role. Here, like, you know, the airplane's flying and you have to try to, everything's moving forward. You have to try to do, to do the best you can. You know, I think that my parents, a lot of people ask me how they pulled it off. And I think I really, in my heart of hearts, I never discussed it with them directly, but in my heart of hearts, I think that they made a decision right away that, that their, the needs of, of us children are gonna be paramount and that they're willing to look away from their own comfort level and their own cover it, doing things that might be challenging all for the sake of the kids. And it was just so obvious in everything they did that there was that level of mindfulness that I spoke about. And that and I'll give you just two examples. Um, we, had, we had a yard site suda for my father, al So we did it once in 10 years. So we, you know, we, we decided we didn't want to do it every single year, but we did round numbers. In other words, at, at 10, we were still children, but once we started getting married, we did 20 and 30 and 40. So my mother didn't go. My mother didn't go to those yard side suits out of respect for Abba. But Abba went out of respect for us as children. That was, it's a small example, it might not seem like a lot, but it was just that level of mindfulness, what's proper, what's appropriate, what will make the children most comfortable. And a second one on top of this, which really blew my mind, and I, I really didn't, um, I didn't even discuss this with Abba till all the way at the end of his life. Um, my father, my biological father, uh, um, is buried in Wellwood Cemetery on Long Island, New York, in Long Island, New York, excuse me. It's about an hour from where we lived, 45 minutes to an hour. Abba drove us, my brother and I, every single year until I got my license. He would drive us, you know, he would step back and let us do our thing and daven and then just drive us home. And I once, later in life, I, I asked, you know, I, I had, had lots of questions, you know, in my mind and, and most of them, many of them went unanswered, but some of them I asked. So I once asked him, I said, Abba, I'm, I'm, I was always curious. Like, I didn't realize it as a kid because I wasn't focused on you. I was focused on my grief and, you know, being at, the, at, at my father's grave and his yard site. Um, I said, why'd you take us? That must've been so uncomfortable for you. That must've been so terribly uncomfortable. You know, you know, you know what's in our minds when we're standing there. You know, I, I, I always say, you know, a second marriage. This is this is the reality, and, and part of the rea You know, we talk about the 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 hope and the encouragement and the reality. The reality is that sometimes it's a it's a huge plan B, and and I always say 
I was the most wonderful person. I wanted my father back. It wasn't his fault. It's not his fault that my father died. But that's just the reality. There was a lot of thrashing around going on through no fault of his own. I wanted my father back. It's not that I didn't want him. I wanted my father back. So, you know, with that in mind, I asked him, so why did you take us? My father had brothers who were alive who I'm sure would have been glad to take us. We could have had some other arrangement. And he said, I talked it over with your mother. This is what Abba told me. He said, I talked, I said, I'm going to try not to get emotional. He said, um, <laughs> I'm not sure, sure I'm going to succeed. He said, I talked it over with your mother and I knew what a hard day it was for you and Yehuda. I didn't want you to feel that you're being pawned off on some, not pawned off, you know, sent off with someone who's not a family member. I wanted you to just feel that you were within, you didn't have to go outside your family on such an uncomfortable day. And I just like such mindfulness and such, um, you know, I, I, I say my parents, their decision was who's the king and who's the pawn. That's really, you know, after that, it's all commentary. Who's the king and who's the pawn when, when feelings come and, and you know, get in, start competing with each other, who, who moves away for whom? And they both moved away for us. They both really put the needs of, our, of, of us as children um, first. And that's something, you know, that I, that I do think um, it would be, it would be a, a best practice to think about. Planning, planning. I, I, I cannot stress enough. I spoke to many therapists over the years about this talk and, and, and because I guide families that are, that are blending families because of my own situation. And virtually every one of us at the, the top of their list to plan, to plan. What do you plan for? Everything, everything. What's schooling going to look like? What are the finances going to look like? Who pays for what? How's that going to work? Um, what are the kids going to call you? How are they going to interact with each other? How are they, you know, there, there's so much, there's so much planning that needs to, that needs to take place in order for this to work. Like I said, a first marriage is different. You don't have all those moving parts. So some of the things, of course, you're not going to think of until they happen. But a therapist who specializes in blending families, and there are some fantastic ones out there, um, they can be so helpful in, you know, coming up with scenarios and um, helping you figure these things out beforehand. Because when you try to wing it and you just say, we'll kind of figure it out, Finances is not a small thing, right? You, you know, each side has money for, you know, that they have money of their own. Not only are you having to, you know, your extended family, God forbid, could get involved if things turn south just with finances. There, there are, like I said, there are constituencies. Later in life, as the kids get older, I guess it's le less complicated. I, I don't know if that's not my experience, but the finances are such a big deal. You know, are you, are you going to keep the kids in the same school? What's that going to look like? How are the arrangements going to work out with the ex? What are you going to call? This? What's the step parent going to be called? Do you know how, what a loaded, loaded issue this is? And some people, some people genuinely don't care much. And that's okay. That's great. I mean, it's fine. It's, you can't tell people how, you can't tell people how to feel, but you know, trying to, to, to let's say, for example, um, in a situation of divorce and, and um, you know, we, we, for example, we called my father daddy, so we called Abba, we called him Abba because it was a, he was Israeli also, but we called him Abba because it was just a different name. It wasn't my father's name. And, you know, many or most people have that sort of practice or that way of thinking about it. Again, no right or wrong, but, you know, if, if, if a step parent wants to be called by the name of the biological parents, or even if the children are okay with it, 
and you start using that name that the biological parent um, is or was called by, you can see how extraordinarily complicated that could make things. So every one of these things should be spoken about beforehand and, and really um, reflected upon. I'll give you another example, just of a situation that I was involved in. Actually, the 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 both uh, step parents, so to speak, you know, the the blended family parents, um, came to me with the following question, um, and I think you can see both sides pretty clearly. Depending on if you're emotion based or rational based, you might feel one way or the other. Um, the question was. Um, the, the, the man, the father, the husband, the husband had a, a was more financially uh, capable than the wife was. So they said that they're going to move into his house. Um, and the woman said that she should please forgive me, but it's life. The woman said that everything in the bedroom has to be cleared out, that she's not going into the marriage, you know, with the same bedroom furniture. Again, I'm not making a value judgment at all. I'm just telling you what happened. So it was so, it was such a, it was such a step backwards for this couple because they got into like a real argument. She was, she was uh, um, horrified that her husband-to-be is going to make a fuss about this and not understand her sensitivity to this. And, and he said, I, I, you know, he says, I'm being so gracious to you. It's, it's, cause, I'm, it's costing me, he had to redo the house. He had to redo the house to, to have her children move in. So he was, I think he was in for over a hundred thousand dollars that he was, that was tight for him. You know, he redid the house that everybody should have. To, they wanted the kids to have their own bedrooms. That's another thing to talk about, right? Are you going to, you know, camp the kids together? Are you going to separate bedrooms? Are you going to try to make accommodations? So he said, I'm in for over $100,000. Why in the world am I spending $24,000 on new bedroom furniture? And he was really upset because he felt that his financial commitment wasn't being validated. Who's right and who's wrong? Whatever. But something like this can, can, can complicate things. So, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer that things, everything is generational. Um, even things that we don't realize are generational. And because my experience is from a generation or two ago, certainly growing up, um, I wanted to hear from, uh, I, I got in touch with a woman. Um, I actually helped she and her new husband when they were trying to acclimate. And I wanted to check back with her. They married a few years. And I, I just asked her lots of questions, lots of questions in terms of therapy, in terms of the roles, you know, um, what's the proper role for, for step parents? Should they be in charge, involved in discipline? Should they, I, I know two generations ago, it was, it was different. Um, like I said, things are generational. I wanted to find out what the current how things are now, just for my own um, knowledge, and because I wanted to share this with you. And and um, she told me that all her friends who went through these, uh, such, you know, with second marriages, went for counseling immediately after getting engaged. And I asked if she would recommend that they go before they get engaged, and she said absolutely yes. If she was doing it again, she would have. Um, you know, so the, there is a whole body of science out there and a, and, a, and a great deal of help that an outsider can do in trying to, to you know, work this out. Um, some advice, again, some my own, some I've heard from therapists and, and, and the like. Um, don't try to replace the parent. Don't try to replace the parent ever. Um, use your authority very sparingly. I'm talking about the step-parent. Um, This woman expressed it, and, and I looked it up and I spoke to a few therapists afterwards. She expressed it in a very wise way. She said that her therapist told her that her role as a stepmother 
to, to her husband's children is to be a safe adult, just to be a safe adult, not to be a parent, not to be anything remotely like a parent, certainly not initially, um, to be predictable, to be consistent, and to be, of course, warm and helpful in, in any of the things that the kids need, but not to, to step in as a parent and you know, to try not to expect obedience uh, from the kids. And another, another part of this is that we shouldn't pretend to be parents, even if sometimes the kids want it. And I, I, uh, uh, two therapists mentioned to me that in their practice, um, they, they were dealing with a number of couples that things were progressing well with the couple and the children were taking to the step spouse, you know, step parent. Um, what one would say as a compliment, you know, faster than usual. <clears throat> and it, it resulted in a great deal of regression. The fact that, that it went along, you know, that that relationship moved forward, what should have taken a longer period of time uh, was sort of telescoped into a, short, in a, into a shorter period of time. And the result of that was, was overall pretty negative because the, the children started to feel very, very guilty that like they abandoned their parent and took, you know, and now had this relationship with the step parent. Um, and, you know, again, follow the wisdom of the experts, follow the wisdom of people who do this regularly and discussing this can be very helpful. Your children and their children. The experts say that you should tell the kids that they don't have to be friends. Um, you know, that they should, of course, be friendly and respectful, not to force that part of the relationship also. Um, and, and it's a process. It's a process. Um, especially, especially since there's there's a lot of grieving, even in the case of divorce, um, when the children, again, I'm speaking generalities, but generally speaking, when the children go to this new family unit, there, there's a sense of grieving over that uncomplicated, reg, quote unquote, regular family that they won't be anymore. And it's, it's, a, it's a process, it's complicated. Some people, of course, adjust better. Some people uh, don't do that well with it. That's why it's what I said at the beginning, you know, to have, to have these, you know, these governing principles and to have this level of mindfulness and self-sacrifice to, to try and make it work depending on what the needs of the, of the kids are, what the, what the needs of the kids are. Um, I, I didn't want to share any discordant notes, but I, I do think it's important as part of this reality check um, to talk for a moment about that grieving process that children are, are undergoing. Um, I, was, I was asked to, to speak a number of years ago, I was asked to, to lecture at, at a retreat for um, teenage girls who lost a parent is a beautiful organization that supports uh, teenage girls who who lost a parent. That's what the organization does. They had a Shabbos, and I went to. Um, they asked me to come speak <clears throat> because of my life experience, and, and uh, of course I said yes. And I spoke to them Friday night, and um, my topic actually was blending families, and I was encouraging the girls um, to think, to think about, you know, to be open to the idea of their parents possibly remarrying. Of course, it's not my place to tell them what to do, but I did say that, you know, that my parents did have a very healthy, uh, um, meaningful second marriage that, that improved, greatly improved the quality of our life. And that I would encourage, I, and, I, and I said that, you know, if you have a teenager, these were all teenage girls, if you have a teenager in the house that's actively opposing a second marriage, that could make things very, 
complicated for this new family unit. That's what I said. And I asked them to be open to the idea. During question and answer, um, I encouraged them to be honest. And in fact, the head of the program, I told them beforehand that if they start answering questions, I didn't know if they would you know, ask me questions. Uh, they don't trust, you know, not having this level of trust yet. I said, but if they start asking questions, I asked her to please consider taking all the adults out of the room and just waiting right outside because they could see in, but the, you know, they, to give the girls a space that to ask questions that they wanted. Oh my goodness. So one of the girls, if I live to be 180, I will never forget this. So one of the girls told me, she said, you know, Rabbi Horowitz, you're telling us that we should not stand in the way of our parents getting married, remarried. And then she said that when they were sitting shiva for her mother, when they were sitting shiva, her mother was the one that had died. When they were sitting shiva for her mother, a Rebetzin came to be Menach Mavel to pay a shiva call. And on the way out, she sat with the children and told them that when the Mashiach comes, when the Messiah comes, um, their family is going to be reunited in the world to come. That's what, that's what this Rebetzin told her, that your family is going to be reunited with your mother again. So this girl told me, she said, well, if I listen to you and my father remarries, where's my mother going to go? And I just thought that my heart would fall out of my chest. She said it with such pain and such agony. It was, it was so raw. It was, I can't even describe, I'm trying to do it justice, I'm not. This is what's going through some of the children's minds. When there's a, a second marriage, not of course always, but possibly so, there's these dual loyalties and it's so, so, so complicated. And that's why, planning and talking things over and knowing um, you know, boundaries and being able to, to navigate your way around this is, is so important. Um, I'll tell you what I answered her. I told her, I said, um, I said, I'll tell you the truth. The Rebbitson was probably, you know, I'm sure she was trying to comfort you and, and I'm sure she meant well, and I'm not, I'm not judging what she said, but from my vantage point, I don't think anybody knows what really goes on on the other side of the curtain. That's what I told her. I said, I, she wanted to make you feel good. I'm sure that's a comforting thought, but doesn't real mean that's the way exactly it goes, who knows? So I said here, you know, you're, you're, you can't base it on something like this because you don't know if it's accurate or not. I certainly don't think. Anyway, that's, you know, I call it thrashing around. And, and sometimes, and, and that's, you know, my final thought in, in the encouragement part, um, encouraging you to think of this as a long-term relationship, as an investment in the lives of your children, your biological children, and your stepchildren even though the environment might not be there, that the kids are ready to put that grieving aside and put that um, searing, searing pain aside. You know, I, I look back as an adult, I'm not talking about my family, I'm talking about you know, my schooling and everything. I, I was thrashing around honestly until I was 16 years old. You know, I, I, I was thrashing around, you know, school was difficult for me. I, I'm, I'm a, a very uh, energetic, uh, you know, out of, out of the box thinker. I, 
this package doesn't really go that well with eighth grade. Um, you know, so, but really in, in actuality, when I look back, I, I was fighting, not anyone in particular. I was just, I call it thrashing because it's, you're not fighting with anybody. You're just fighting with yourself almost. And somehow, I don't know why, just when I hit 16, I said, all right, that's enough. You know, and I, I started to, to, I started to, um, thrash less, <laughs> okay? Um, but, th but this thrashing, um, however long this thrashing period works and goes on, um, it's very possible, and, and that's the cold reality. I said I'd be encouraging. It really is an encouraging thought in the long run. Um, and, and the thrashing hurts people, including step parents, including the biological parents, including the kids themselves. <clears throat> um, so I encourage you to think about what, what I call, this is my own term, um, I call it history's verdict, history's verdict. In, in other words, if you're taking the temperature, excuse me, if you're taking the temperature of your relationship with your stepchild um, at year one, at year three, at year five, um, honestly, like you might not be doing that well yet. That's the brutal reality. The, the, the words of encouragement The words of encouragement that I really want to share with you from, from the bottom of my heart, mindful of all the challenges that I spoke about and that need to be addressed and, and not minimizing any of it. Um, to share that, that report card that I talked about, you know, first year one, year three, year five, how you're doing in terms of a relationship with, with the stepkids um, who are thrashing and trying to figure it out and trying to settle everything. Um, that's the short-term report card. History's verdict is so different. History's verdict is so different. Um, I can tell you from my own experience that growing into adulthood and looking back and saying to yourself, <clears throat> no, I didn't get my father back, um, but this was an incredibly wonderful person that treated my mother with respect. They made decisions by what was best for us. He gets a 10 plus in my. That's history's verdict. And I'd love to tell you that you'll see it right away. I hope you do, but you know, when kids tend to look back, those are the questions they ask. Did you have my back? Did you treat my parent with respect? You made mistakes. History's verdict doesn't notice mistakes. History's verdict doesn't notice the stuff, the day-to-day -day stuff. This is what life has taught me. You know, in fact, I'll tell you something unrelated to this, but I want, I just want, I want you to understand exactly what I mean by this history's verdict and how different it is than the verdict you feel, that sinking feeling you have in your, parent, in your stomach when you're trying to parent an adolescent stepchild and you're having all kinds of difficulty and you understand that be very upset. Um, Sometimes parents 
um, more often fathers than mothers, but it really could be, it, it has been either way, um, where God forbid there's contentious fighting going on between the, between the parents, God forbid, Rahman al-Sun. I always say that I had a better as an orphan than parents who fight around it during a divorce. Um, and the parent, a parent will come and ask me, should I fight back? Like, what should I do? Um, I'm losing a certain custody, whatever, whatever it is, whatever the thing, is, whatever the it is, there's quarreling going on and it's gonna wind up. And I usually tell parents, obviously every situation is different, but in many situations where I feel that, where they feel that they're not gonna accomplish anything other than just getting it out of their system, I tell them to wait for history's verdict. And you know what happens in many of these cases? I've seen it time and time and time again. If one parent is, is quarreling and the other parent steps back and takes it on the chin to protect the child, the kids might not understand it at the time, um, but they become adults. And when parents are fighting in court, you know what I tell them? When parents fight in court and, and drag kids through this stuff, I tell them, I say, you got a six-year-old at home. You can explain anything to a six-year-old. Take an 18-year-old, take a 20-year-old and try to explain that. What are you gonna tell your 20-year-old? How you conducted yourself during this time. That's history's verdict the other way. And what, you, what I found usually happens is once the kids figure it out, they gravitate towards the parent that, that didn't expose them to this stuff and turn their back on the other parent because they get it. History's verdict is usually spot on. So those are my closing thoughts. Um, with all the challenges and with all the issues that you have and trying to fix this plane while it's flying. I encourage you to, to give it your best shot. Study, learn. Every person that can give you one piece of advice um, is one in the wing column. I'm gonna post up, I, 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 we, wrote, we wrote an article I said called Blending Families and I actually interviewed my mother on my father's 50th yard site. I asked her what advice would she give to someone who just lost her husband? I said, Ma, what, 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 what has, 50 years taught you. And um, <clears throat> it was published in Mishpacha magazine and it's called One Foot in Front of the Other. I'll, I'll post it up on the various um, platforms and I'll try to make it available to, to uh, you can look it up actually. They're both probably in Times of Israel. If you do Google search Yaakov Horowitz, One Foot in Front of the Other and Yaakov Horowitz Blending Families. I think they're both in Times of Israel. Um, you, you could be able to access it that way very simply. Um, so I interviewed my mother and I said, Ma, what would you want? You know, my father, Abba, had already died. And uh, um, she, she said, yeah, Yanki, you know, come on, I told you everything I had to say. Uh, you know, I, I did a lot of foolish things in my life. That was a good one. I, I had such, I loved every minute of it. I, 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 <laughs> she was the most resilient person I ever met and one of the spunkiest. She had such a great sense of humor. She was always laughing, you know, especially at herself, she was great. <laughs> so um, it was published in Mishpacha magazine. It, it, it wrote, it said one foot in front of the other by, by Bela Nudovic. And at the bottom prepared for publication, right? I wrote the piece of course. <laughs> My mother didn't tell a soul that I wrote it. <laughs> it was hysterical. She would come over, they say, hey, Bela, I didn't know you knew how to write. So yeah, where do you think Yankee got it from? You know, she, she was the cat's meow and I was so happy to have the privilege of, you know, hanging out with her and, and doing this together. But she had some really good pieces of advice to, to, to single parents um, about, you know, carving out your privacy, your space and your privacy about, about um, trusting your instincts. So she, it's really, it was a really nice, it was a, it's a nice piece and I hope uh, she wrote, she did a great job writing it. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, but, but, you know, that's, that's what I'd love to leave you with this, the, the hope 
and the belief that if you follow, you follow a guarding principle and you follow um, some best practices and you make lots and lots of mistakes, which I'm sure you will, your children will They'll figure it out with history's verdict. And in my heart of hearts, I believe that they will be extraordinarily grateful. You know, I, I taught in eighth grade for 15 years. Um, the, when I started my career in Chena 40 years ago, I taught in eighth grade. Um, many of the years, I, when, whenever it was available, school was tracked. I always volunteered for the kids who hadn't yet succeeded in learning. <clears throat> That's what I did. And I always felt, and I feel now, that a student who hasn't made it yet in school has a relationship with someone who trusts in him and works on their relationship. I believe that that connection and that bond is much stronger than any Aleph student has with their teacher. Aleph student meaning, you know, a A plus student. Because they love their teachers, the teachers love them, but they could get by without them. You know, it's a relationship. They respect them. They'll talk to them in the third person. They'll quote all the Torah that they taught them. It's great. It's beautiful. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. There's nothing wrong with that. But that deep bond that you create with a child that you believed in and protected and um, brought out the best in him or her, that's almost, there's nothing like it. And I really believe that that's the opportunity, the long-term opportunity to, to be there, to shelter the children from whatever you can, the stepchildren even, and to rebuild their allow them to rebuild their lives, allow them to finish thrashing and start their lives. So from the bottom of my heart, I wish you mazel and bracha. I hope you found this helpful. You can um, feel free to write some questions as follow-up if anybody's interested. I tried to address the questions that I got so far now, but I'll be glad to do a second follow-up if anyone finds it helpful. Good Shabbos, everyone. Best wishes for an easy fast. And um, I hope you find it meaningful. Matzai Shabbos. At 1030, I'm going to be doing a, a Zoom live here, a Zoom here. I'm reading, I'm doing 15 minutes of Torah, to, uh, of Torah thoughts, uh, Tisha B'Av thoughts, um, and then reading Gil Seicha. It's not meant for people who can um, go to shul, but it is intended for, for folks who cannot make it to shul. Um, so feel free to join us. Best wishes again for Gachavis and, and Nizi.